Hi, everyone. Um, as you all know, this um, presentation is called The Beauty of Human Variation, um, Tips and Techniques for Painting Diverse Skin Tones and Features. Um, this presentation is going to focus on um, racial and ethnic variation specifically, though variations in bodies, identities, sexualities, genders, and neurology are an essential part of human variation and part of what makes humanity as exciting as it is. So um, to give a bit of an overview, in the first section, I'm going to talk a bit about why I tend to frame this discussion around the term human variation rather than diversity alone. Um, I'll talk a bit about an approach I find counterproductive, and then I will describe why I believe human variation is something that should be at the forefront of an illustrator's especially a medical illustrator's mind. Um, in part two, I'll talk more about the how, touching on how I use reference material, how I tend to approach creating diverse features, techniques that I use for rendering vibrant skin tones. And then finally, the bulk of the time will be spent on a demo where I'll walk everyone through the creation of three portraits. So why do I tend to frame it more as human variation rather than capital D diversity? So in my observation, some can get stuck on the word diversity, it can have a lot attached to it, particularly when it comes to one's view of social and political issues. These are very important, obviously, but can center a narrow view of race and the tragedy of the struggle against racism rather than the complexity and expansiveness of the human experience. The race as a social and political construct has been a constant factor in my life. I consider that in many ways a tragedy. I am, at the end of the day, a person with hopes, specific needs, and a rich internal world who happens to be brown. I don't simply paint diverse people because racism is bad. I do it because the, difference, the differences in our bodies often lead to clinically significant differences in what care we need. And I do it because I see no other way to fully embrace the joy of being an artist and the joy of being exposed to so many different people in these modern times. In some cases, the fact that diversity is so loaded can make it easier to fall into a trap of focusing very heavily on checking off boxes of different racial and ethnic groups and trying to make the portrayals of people fit their ideas of those groups. Representation shouldn't come at the expense of treating people as varied, complex, individuals with different needs. Often, real people don't necessarily fit one's idea of these groups, or different people can fit into the same group in drastically different ways. There may be interesting trends in their features, but each individual person is a completely unique and interesting variation, in just one example. The harder you try to make human beings fit into rigid categories, the more likely they are to disrupt them. So here you can see that all of these people share some trends in their features. However, they still look very different and aren't all from the same ethnic group. I like to use myself as an example. I'm black and both of my parents are black. All of my grandparents were black. My features definitely share certain trends of black features. However, throughout much of my life, many have assumed I must not be fully black because I don't neatly fit many people's idea of what, a, of what a black person looks like. Someone who sets out to draw a black person might not come up with, my, with, might not come up with me or might pass over me as an example because they don't think I look black enough. I look black enough because I am black. There's nothing else I could be. I'm not biracial. I'm just one example of a black person, one variation that is just as legitimate and just as black as others. So what's a common pitfall? What's a bit of a limiting approach in my opinion? Attempting to think of and portray people in averages with the goal of inclusivity or making the greatest number of people feel seen through one example. This might manifest in trying to come up with the most average looking person that accounts for everybody, or maybe even the most average looking person of a particular race or ethnic group and leaving it at that. This can actually be exclusive rather than inclusive. When one works mainly in averages, they exclude features and skin tones that fall outside of those averages. There's no middle brown skin tone that accounts for everyone's skin tone. A middle brown skin tone is still just one. An average nose that doesn't read as any particular type of nose ethnically is still just one nose. You have one nose, 
one face, one skin tone, one body, even though it'll change over time, it's still only one at a time and its trajectory through time is unique. Though humanity is an endless spectrum, each individual person is just one. I prefer to paint just one at a time and add in little specific details that might make different people feel seen. A particular distinct nose shape, a particular hair texture and so on. Human faces and bodies don't really emerge in neat, predictable ways because there are billions of possible combinations. I avoid giving measurements or saying this is how such and such features should be drawn or painted. I don't think there will ever be a time when you have cracked the code of how people of a particular group look overall. You'll never be done discovering. And to me, that's exciting and fun. So why human variation? For all of human history, our diversity is one of the things that has made us so successful as a species. We're collaborative and adaptable, each making up one tiny part of a diverse whole. We look so different because we spread out over an entire planet, survived all different environments, moved, and mixed, and eaten different things, passed on all different combinations of genetics, survived horrors of our environment and other human beings. My face and body tells a story. My grandparents on my mother's side immigrated from Jamaica. They were in Jamaica because someone enslaved and brought their ancestors there. Some of my grandfather's ancestors escaped enslavement, formed free settlements in extremely difficult terrain, and occasionally mixed with the indigenous Arawak people there. They were called Maroons. I have my mom's hairline. I've noticed a lot of Jamaican people have this hairline, and some old photos of Arawak people also have this hairline. My name tells a story. My last name is Wilson because at some point someone with the last name Wilson probably owned my ancestors on my father's side. Or perhaps someone who escaped enslavement picked that last name. I don't know much, of, much else about my father's side, but I know I have my father's nose. My mother's maiden name was Hall. It was Hall because someone with the last name Hall owned some of her ancestors at some point. I've looked at the last name Hall in Jamaica before and found information about sugar plantations there. I come from my ancestors and they survived unspeakable horrors of the human condition and gave me my face. If I had a different, if I had had different ancestors, I would look different. If history had been different, I would look different. Though some of my ancestors stories have been lost or stolen, they still exist in me. Every single person's face and body tells a story. Many of these stories will never be told except in their features existing. You can't separate the tragedy, resilience, and triumph of my history from my face, not really. I don't say this meaning that every time you paint someone, you need to come up with an entire story for their features, or that you even need to know where every type of feature you want to paint comes from. More that I encourage you to approach features and people with curiosity, gratitude, excitement, and reverence for the implications of so many possibilities. You will never run out of new things to discover about human beings and their story, their stories. For me, this is what it's all about. So now that I've talked a bit about the why, I wanna dive into the how. So how do I create new faces and how do I approach features? An important part of the process for me is finding and piling an ever-growing bank of references and inspiration. I recommend thinking of it as chasing novelty. Add examples of as many interesting faces and features as you can. Try to push yourself to notice interesting features in those around you. I try to re avoid relying on any one particular reference or face too heavily. I don't want to create a likeness of this person. I want to use aspects of their face as a reference to create something new. I might have six different references at once. I like to change and be creative with features, but it's always a good idea to refer back to something tangible and real. I try to find images with good examples of texture and I try to avoid overly harsh lighting where a lot of visual information is lost. However, it's less about the specific references and more about the types of information I'm using them for. Some references are more generally inspiring or interesting. Some I might use for skin texture. Some I might use for a particular feature I find interesting. Some might be helpful for a tricky angle. So here you can see some examples from a Pinterest board that I constantly add to. You can see there's a lot of different types of faces and skin tones and different ages. Here are some more examples. I never consider the search over. Um, this takes me to my next point, which is made much easier with reference material. 
And it's why I tend to make up new faces. One of the reasons that I like to make up faces is because one can be really limited by their surroundings and their friends, family, and coworkers as far as diversity goes. In my case, I work independently and remotely. If I were to rely on the people who are easily within reach, my options would be very limited. I might be able to go out, find and ask some strangers if I can take pictures of them, but that would take a ton of time and could potentially be dangerous. For me, the best way to explore variation as much as possible is to make up faces, bodies, and people frequently. One thing that I find important is knowing when to sort of disregard portraiture rules and idealized measurements. Relying too heavily on idealized measurements that artists tend to learn can make it a bit harder to show a good range of human variation. Though these can be a very helpful framework for understanding how a face works, the average person doesn't have a perfectly symmetrical face that fits these measurements, and they often don't really account for variation in ethnicity. Faces can end up looking the same, or the illustrator can end up having, a tr having trouble making people look ethnically distinct. I also avoid thinking of making a face attractive or not attractive. That isn't really a factor or framing that I find particularly helpful or relevant. I just try to come up with someone that looks real and distinct and treat each portrait with the same level of attention and excitement. So now I'm going to move on to skin. Once I've gotten the structure down, I need to start rendering the skin tone. Now there are plenty of cases where skin tones must be simplified or stylized. I'm focusing on fully rendered portrayals. So some of this might not necessarily apply as much for simplified or stylized work, but you might be able to take some um, little bits of information from this and apply it to your work if that's what you tend to do. For me, skin tones aren't just a single color. There's a base color, but also an undertone and often some sort of atmospheric light. Skin doesn't exist in a vacuum, even when you have simplified and standardized the surroundings. Skin is heavily influenced by its environment and also its contents and specific properties. The thickness of the skin, how much melanin and the type of melanin that's present, the blood vessels there, the structural integrity of the skin, and so on and so forth, all contribute to how it looks to the eye. One thing I recommend is to train your eye to recognize subtle undertones and color changes in skin. There are often considerable local color changes in the skin that have a large impact on the way a particular skin tone reads. There might be some redness, some translucency, some hyperpigmentation, and so on. And these details are often very useful for portraying pathologies as well. Notice how in this fine art picture, I've chosen to make his lips more pink in the middle rather than make the entire lip pink or brown. That's a detail I've noticed in some people and wanted to include. I, that, that's also um, the case for me, which you probably can't really tell from, um, you know, <laughs> the view of me right now. Another example of something similar is paying attention to how the palms of the hands, soles of the feet, and nail beds tend to be much lighter than the rest of the skin on darker skin tones. So notice how in, in this illustration, I balanced highlights, shadows, and local color changes to add realism to the skin. The thickened skin of the calluses <laughs> appears more yellowed, and you can see evidence of blood flow beneath the skin in my choice of oranges and pinks in the fingertips and soles. One thing I often notice is the, is the skin of joints and knuckles appearing slightly darker as well. And I often like to add that in. And this image I've chosen to make the lips of this woman pink as that helps to make her skin tone read in the way that I want it to. The eczema I've depicted is more hyperpigmented rather than red. So just keeping in mind details, details, details is really, really important to me. And um, it can also sort of humanize the subject. I like to subtly layer colors on top of each other with a textured pore-like brush that I create so that different colors can peek through. And that can also really push the realism. I tend to avoid a specific predetermined color palette when I'm rendering skin tones. Um, and though that might be helpful for others, I just tend to make decisions as I go 
And um, I also want to point out the use of green and gray at the corners of the mouth. So taking into account reflected light is especially important for darker skin tones. Um, a common issue when rendering darker skin tones is losing detail in the features because the skin hasn't been lit properly. And just because the skin tone is dark doesn't mean that all the colors you use will be dark. I've used a considerable amount of orange, cyan, purple, and even gray in these examples. So take note of how I've rendered the forehead and the jawline. The addition of reflected light and confident specular highlights makes it easier to see all of the details in the features. I find making these skin tone balls pretty helpful as studies, and they help me test out different ways to get skin to read how I want it to. In some cases, greens and grays are very helpful in getting the skin to more look like to look more like skin rather than plastic. You can note the different undertones I've used as well as the, diff as the different colors that I've chosen for the highlights. So I, I use um, a lot of greens, purples. Often when I include highlights, they aren't just you know, purely a lighter version of the rest of the skin. And so for this next part, um, I'm going to play a demo walkthrough of me painting these three portraits. And um, since I had so much footage to cut down, there are a couple of places where I had to skip over a little bit of information, but I can always go into more detail and explain what I did um, when, if there's any confusion. Oh, I have some trouble getting this out of the way. So um, often when I kind of start out making a portrait like one of these, I sort of just rough in um, a, the, the basic shapes that have to do with kind of like the, the shape of the face, the shape of the jaw, the shape of the skull. Um, I used to do a little bit more roughing in the basic kind of skull shape underneath. Um, and over time, I've kind of had less of a need to do that. Um, it also, as many of, of you, I'm sure, have experienced, tends to, you know, not look as good in the beginning, and then, you know, quickly you're like, oh, it starts to look like a face. Um, I also often make a lot of little corrections as I go, and I might, it might take a little time um, for the portrait to kind of start looking correct and right. And um, sometimes I'll sort of rock in little measurements or indicators for myself. Um, and sometimes it doesn't necessarily um, feel like something that I need to do. You can kind of see here that I'm, you know, making little adjustments, little, um, little corrections and trying to resolve the important edges um, because clarity is a pretty important thing for me to start with when I'm, um, you know, creating a portrait from scratch. You can also notice that um, I've kind of indicated to myself that I don't really, I don't necessarily want her jawline to be, you know, extremely snatched, um, <laughs> if that makes any sense to somebody. And here I'm kind of cleaning up some of the, um, you know, extra lines that I have, I've included and, um, you know, building in little, little details like the jaw and the chin, making little adjustments. Um, here, you could see that I flipped the portrait just to make sure that nothing was looking, um, you know, really off or wonky or anything. You can also see that um, at some point I had changed the shape of her um, lips and kind of her mouth shape. That's something that I just might do um, throughout the time where I'm, you know, creating a sketch of for a portrait, I just sort of make little decisions, kind of whichever I feel like at the time, there isn't necessarily a big reason why I might choose um, one particular thing over another. So here I'm starting with the second portrait. I think in, in reality, this probably took me, I don't know, maybe, maybe 30 or 40 minutes. I'm not really sure. It didn't really, it didn't take particularly that long. Um, and it can sometimes be a little bit quicker if I'm in a rush. 
Hillary, you're working from multiple references that are off this screen, right? Um, yeah, usually just to kind of double check things and sort of give myself an idea of what I might want to um, include. I'll just have kind of multiple references up. Um, as time's gone on, I sort of rely on them a little bit less, but I always find them to be really important for making little corrections as I go. Um, it's always helpful to look at something real and be like, okay, is this a possibility? And how do I make this um, kind of read the way that I want it to? Um, I think here I was really kind of intrigued by um, some of the shapes of a uh, particular um, shape of kind of monolid eye that I had seen where I really liked the sort of gentle swoop that <laughs> kind of goes around and um, resolves itself next to the bridge of the nose. And I was really excited about that and wanted to include it. And often that's something that I sort of do is I'll, I'll see something and be like, ooh, that would be really kind of fun to, to get into and, and, and draw um, for this portrait. And um, in kind of the real, in real life, that would often um, kind of reflect its way. And if I just needed a, um, you know, an image of a face or a person or a part of a face or um, part of a body, um, I'll just sort of be like, oh, okay, this is a really interesting um, time for me to just, you know, paint a cool face. <laughs> You can see I'm kind of making little adjustments and um, trying to make sure that I resolve the important edges of the features. Often I, um, in my head when I'm making a sketch, I'll sort of think of um, something that David Reaney from the um, Johns Hopkins Department of Art is Applied to Medicine would say which is that you should be able to give a sculptor your sketch or um, something that you've made like that. And they should be able to kind of sculpt it in 3D from the information that you've given them. And I always try to keep that in mind. Um, so shout out to David Reaney. <laughs> In these um, examples, I was, um, for the most part, just leaving sort of a bit of a bit of gestural hair um, because it wasn't really the focus necessarily. Um, I probably would add more detail to them if they were more of a, a prominent part of the information that I was trying to get across. So for the most part, I sort of let them fall into the background. And you can see here, uh, I'm taking kind of the same general approach to crafting each um, face. Um, for some, it might be helpful to kind of rough in more of the, um, the basic shapes. That's, off, that's something that I, um, depending on how something's going, I might do a little more roughing in um, little um, indications for myself. There, there was a bit of a jump because I, I really needed to cut down on some of the time. I also often like to, I, I'm somebody, I'm a self-described um, just nose connoisseur, I guess. So in most cases, if it's possible for me to make an interesting nose, um, I'll usually err on the side of doing that just because I love noses. Um, <laughs> so in each, pretty much each example, um, that was one of the things that I think um, has a lot of bang for your buck when it comes to making somebody somebody read as um, you know ethnically distinct. I find noses to be deeply interesting and um, and something that I kind of get constant enjoyment out of studying and um, finding ways to kind of work them in to my um, just body of work. Um, and here, um, you also notice that one of the things that I'm kind of doing is 
working on all of them at the same time. Um, that's something that I tend to um, like to do if I'm working on sort of similar things and want to be pretty quick and efficient with it. I might just do multiple at once. So here now I'm going to start um, roughing in the colors. Um, in this case, I kind of pick, you know, just sort of a base color that I'm going to start with. Um, it can be kind of important to just sort of, you know, pick one and realize that um, in most cases, I'm going to turn on alpha lock and then kind of add in some subtlety to the local colors. Um, you can see I'm kind of adding in some more subtle colors that aren't necessarily, you know, shadows per se, um, but they sort of begin to develop the undertones of the skin tone. Here it's starting to kind of add in a little bit of, of the structure, but um, for the most part, my main goal at, at this point is establishing some of those color changes. And you can see I kind of had to skip a little bit ahead, um, but make note of how I've added in some greens, some cyan, um, especially along the edges where the structure sort of dives back away from the viewer. Um, you can also kind of make note of how I've added a little bit of sort of cooler gray tones around the mouth. That's something that I notice um, often in um, skin tones when I'm kind of looking at people. Um, one of the things that sort of makes it read a bit more um, at, like in the way that I want it to is figuring out ways of including these little, um, you know, little bits of green, these little bits of gray. Another detail to make note of is um, with her lips, I've chosen to make the top lip a little bit darker than her bottom lip. Um, that's just another kind of filed away detail, I guess. And here you've also seen that I've um, roughed in some of the kind of structural um, shadows and everything. And um, at this stage, I've decided, okay, I'm going to start roughing in some of the colors for the other portraits as well. Um, and then um, over time, I'll go back and forth between um, all, th all three, essentially. And here for her skin tone, I really wanted it to have um, kind of an interesting sort of um, almost sort of golden orangey tone um, where I'd sort of noticed one of noticed the skin tone like that I was like oh I kind of want to want to I guess pay some homage to that um, also notice how I added in a little bit of almost a purplish color um, around her eyes that's something that I notice pretty often in people um, that there might be some kind of um, cooler tones or kind of purplish tones sometimes even little pinkish tones around um, around someone's eyes. And then you'll also notice a lot of the greens and yellows as well um, for this particular, almost like lighter olive -y tone. Um, you can also notice how at uh, sort of around the corner of the mouth, where the lips sort of meet the corner of the mouth, I add a bit of a grayish purple tone there. Um, that's another one of those little details that I sort of picked up on and use it to add a little bit of realism and kind of weight to the skin tone. Um, I tend to um, not really use too many um, different brushes necessarily. A lot of the time, um, I think that you can get very far with just a regular 
um, kind of just round brush, maybe a sort of soft edge one, and then um, some, you know, I might have a couple of bonus brushes that I, I use every now and then, but for the bulk of the work is done with maybe two or three different brushes that I sort of just change the flow and, um, and opacity of. For this portrait, I kind of wanted to give her a bit more of a golden um, skin tone. So that's kind of the, the base color that I picked for that, but um, sort of like the others, I'm gonna end up adding a lot more to the skin tone before I actually get into the um, full rendering, I guess. Again, some more kind of grays. Um, orange was also pretty um, important for me getting the skin tone to read how I wanted um, wanted it to. Um, there was another kind of time jump as well. Um, and then notice for her lips, I chose to make it more so that the there was um, the pigmentation of her lips was a bit darker around the edges. So that's something that I've kind of noticed in this, a, a lot of the time in this particular skin tone that I kind of wanted to um, portray and always think looks really cool. I, always, I just really like the different color palettes that um, different types of skin tones offer, um, if that makes sense. And again, around her eyes, there's some um, cooler tones. Uh, again, trying to kind of um, work back and forth with getting those kind of golden tones that I wanted to bring forward and really highlight. A lot of the time when I'm painting a portrait, um, I think a lot of the process is thinking about something that I want to highlight and really trying to um, get at the essence of what that thing was and what, what made me excited to include it in the first place. Could I ask another quick question? Sure. Um, do you frequently work on white backgrounds or like if you know that the, the the person is going to be situated on a specific background color or image, do you ever work on top of those so you can see like the interplay of of what's happening in the background and that how, how it makes it read in the foreground? Um, yes. So for something like this, um, since I was kind of meaning to have the background and the surroundings essentially be as kind of standardized and um, limited as possible. That's why I kind of just worked on a white background. A lot of the time if I'm doing some interesting lighting or I want to have the um, skin tone kind of um, more grounded in its surroundings, then I'm more likely to work on um, either a di like a different color or a really roughed in version of what the um, color scheme of the eventual background will be. Here I'm kind of like sculpting out some of the um, structure of the face, trying to just make sure that um, the you can kind of tell what the structure is here. Um, I think it's important to note the addition of green and then also the addition of um, some cyan to her hair. Um, one thing that I kind I often notice is with very dark. Um, you know, hair um, that's meant to read more as black rather than really dark brown. Um, the addition of kind of blues and cyans can kind of help to, and, and sometimes even purples can kind of help get that across. 
We have a hey, question man. that's in person. Yeah, we have a quick question from someone in the watch party. Oh, hi. I was noticing how you're picking uh, the colors and they're honestly very beautiful and look so vibrant on the skin. But I find uh, choosing colors has always been a difficult task for me, especially uh, for skin tones. So I'll choose a color and when I apply it to the face, it looks discordant with the colors I already put down. So I was wondering, uh, during your process, do you just pick directly from the color wheel or do you start with a palette? I mean, maybe at this point you no longer use stuff like that, but if you had any recommendations uh, about how people can practice choosing good colors that look vibrant on the skin. Um, I tend to pick directly from the um, the color wheel, and um, for the most part, even though it can look like the colors are fairly random, um, for the most part, there is a bit of a method to the madness, I guess. So um, a lot of the time, um, when especially when it comes to, I don't know if you can kind of see um, with this current portrait that's being focused on, especially along the edges of where the highlights are and the sh it sort of dives back into shadows. I use really saturated um, color that's kind of a really saturated goldish orange. Um, so a lot of the time, if I'm picking colors, um, I tend to um, go more saturated than I maybe need to and then sort of um, knock them back somewhat. Um, and then also I might take into account um, little details that I've noticed in how um, certain uh, materials, so skin in particular, interact with the environment. So skin is actually very rough. It isn't particularly, it, when, you know, microscopically, we all know that skin is, is fairly rough. It isn't a perfectly smooth surface. So um, a lot of that bouncing um, is one of the things that kind of um, leads to some of the I guess like the color choices that I am adding of kind of the purplish grays along the jawline. Um, so I think that one thing that really helps me is to think about what's likely happening um, from kind of just a light bouncing on a material standpoint and then including uh, and then basing my color choices on that. So you notice here there's some kind of orangey, kind of pinky tones in her cheeks and everything. Um, often when I include something like that, it's sort of showing a bit of, a, of an indication of some blood flow beneath the, the skin. Um, and for those, I tend to use a very saturated color, but we um, have, you know, try to use a bit of a light hand with it. So, um, you know, you'll also notice that I have a bit of a more, um, saturated orange color on her nose as well. So a lot of the time I add more saturated colors than I maybe need to and knock them back. Or if the skin is particularly thick or thin in a location, then that kind of affects my color choices, if that makes sense. It might be helpful to start with a, a palette, a predetermined palette, um, if you find that um, color picking is, is something that you struggle with. Um, I tend to not do that, but I could definitely see how that would be really helpful. Um, if it's, if you struggle a little bit with that, I guess, um, additional decision-making or something as you're um, painting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's perfect, thank you. Oh, another thing to notice um, as you're watching is how I often um, sort of start with um, not the color of the eyebrows for um, the eyebrows. Um, one thing that I um, find helps me a lot is um, using greens or cyan, depending on what the skin tone is. And then um, kind of knocking that back and then doing the more of the detail of the um, eyebrows on top of that. So here I'm starting to add in some of those um, 
eyebrow details, paying attention to the directionality. I often find if I don't sort of start with a bit of a shadowy color, then the eyebrows can look a bit jarring and harsh. We've got another quick question from the watch party. Hi, Hillary. Thank you so much for uh, showing us your workflow. Um, my question is about your layers. I've been looking at your lay layers panel and I, I have to ask, um, do you um, work on one layer with your skin tones and then another layer for the hair? And how do you organize that? Um, great question. So um, often um, there's a little bit of variation in this, but for the most part, I try to keep my layers um, fairly simple unless there's something that um, kind of requires me to keep more track of more layers. I, I tend to get really confused by them. So what I often do is have sort of the basic, um, you know, baseline skin tone and colors. Um, depending on what the hairstyle is, I might have the hair on a different layer. Um, so that it's a little bit easier. And then um, I often will have my sketch that I will sort of, um, you know, turn into an easier to manage color. So I turn that from black to maybe a brownish color. And then on top of that, I'll sort of have a lot of the details. Um, you can see that I actually just collapsed the layers. Um, I find that to be pretty helpful for kind of cleaning things up. Um, I might leave more of the layers kind of live if I need to based on what the, the project is or you know just what the needs are. Um, but I tend to keep them pretty minimal for the most part. Thank you so much. And another quick question. Have you ever used the smudge tool or the blend tool when you're creating portraits? Um, not in Photoshop. Um, in Photoshop, I tend to prefer the kind of going back and forth with selecting and, and blending that way. Um, if you happen to use Procreate a lot, um, I find that the smudge tool in Procreate tends to work a little bit better for me. So that's what I tend to do if I'm ever um, you know, working in Procreate. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. A quick question for me actually, because I'm curious now, but do you have a preference between Procreate and Photoshop or what are the strengths that you see in each? Um, I think that they, they're they um, both really um, kind of fun tools to use. I tend to prefer Photoshop overall, but I think part of that is probably because I have, you know, a giant <laughs> Wacom Cintiq. Um, so it's a huge <laughs> workspace, which is just a bit nicer. Um, and my iPad isn't, it's, the, it's not the biggest size. It's like the next one down, which is better for portability. So um, if I am kind of just wanting to do something sort of quick, I really like to use the iPad for that. But sometimes I can find it difficult to um, really have the capacity to um, get into a lot of the details. And then I also find it difficult sometimes with workflow just because you can't really, um, and maybe they have a solution for this, but in the past, um, I've run into the issue of not being able to um, go in between Procreate and Photoshop if you have any masks. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Another detail, I guess, to, to just to point out, um, so I like, notice how even doing the um, kind of her hairline, I didn't just make that straight. I was in this case trying to go for like she had sort of you know slicked her hair back a bit. Um, but even then, it's not you know a perfectly straight um, effect, if that makes sense. Also make note of how um, I tend to, put some more bluish tones around the borders of the um, iris. I just find that it makes the eye look a bit less stark 
Um, I also often notice a bit, some kind of bluish tones in the eye, but um, I try to be careful to not push that too far just because um, that could be a sign of certain, um, certain syndromes essentially. So for example, um, blue sclera is sometimes a sign of um, um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Or I think there's you know, certain things where your, uh, your, your sclera is more likely to appear more blue. So I try to, um, even when I'm you know, having a lot of fun with the colors, um, make sure that I'm still keeping in mind um, how some of the subtleties that you include can um, indicate certain things um, if somebody were to really be paying close attention. <laughs> so I, I just find all of these little details to be really, really interesting. Um, and so that's something that I, I kind of find um, exciting. And in all these um, cases, as I'm sort of building the colors of the skin tone, um, you know, for the most part, you might not necessarily, like I often don't necessarily have to go into this much detail, um, but sometimes I, you know, it's fun. <laughs> so I might just go a little crazy and want to do it. And then also I thought it'd be um, helpful to really show pushing the um, detail of the skin tones for this, for the purposes of this, um, um, presentation. to um, draw more attention to just kind of details that you might notice in real life and um, kind of want to just include um, as like an example of how something looks. Um, in this case, the sort of interesting interplay between the sort of central band of her face and then also the forehead and how her forehead's a little up oh, here. It's kind of finished, I might pause it, but um, I made her forehead a little bit darker because that sort of interplay of local color changes is something that I've noticed in people. Um, and so I tend to include those little types of um, details. And um, that's that's it. Um, at, uh, overall, this, all three of these portraits probably took me around six or seven hours. Um, and then I, you know, you know, compressed all of that into the time here, but that's um, for the most part um, with, it doesn't take me necessarily that long to um, render these types of skin tones, just because at this point I um, have a bit of a um, you know, general process that I tend to kind of do. And, um, and I feel as though in a lot of cases, once you're sort of have trained your eye to see those types of details, it makes it much easier to include them. Um, are there any other questions? All right, folks, if you're at the in-person, feel free to let Alex know um, if you have a question and if you are joining us via Zoom, feel free to write in the chat or you can raise your hand and you can come on mic and ask Hillary directly if you like. <laughs> 
Really beautiful work, by the way. And thank you. Thank you for pointing out those little details along the way, just these little things that you've learned and picked up on over time. That's super, super valuable. So thank you. Of course. Thank you. I think I see some. Oh, saw some movement in the room there. We have another question from the in person room, just making the way down. was wolfing down a muffin while I was uh, walking down the stairs. <laughs> so um, my question has a bit of a story to it. So my, um, my husband's Egyptian. And when I first met him, he had long hair and his hair was, was like ringlets. And um, I, uh, I, uh, I did a portrait of him. And um, I remember before he cut his hair, I really wanted to braid it. I, I love braiding hair. I love braiding. I love doing Dutch braids. And I sat him down and I started brushing his hair, which was a huge mistake. And I, I wish I knew better. I, I should have wet it instead of brushed it. Um, so he was, uh, it was an unpleasant experience for him, unfortunately, but I, I learned my lesson. And um, when I was doing his portrait, I noticed uh, um, I would get confused where to put the highlights and where to put the shadows in his curly hair. And I was wondering um, if you have any tips um, Hillary, when drawing that kind of uh, uh, Egyptian, North African curly hair? Um, yes, so um, I, I guess it kind of depends on the um, curl pattern that you're dealing with. So um, the approach that I might use for curly hair is going to vary um, based on if it's kind of more like loose ringlets or something, or if it's very tightly coiled hair that really scatters a lot of light. Um, I find that with um, kind of looser ringlets where um, there are fewer different curl patterns on the head. Um, it's in a lot of cases, I find it to be um, easier to indicate larger shapes um, rather than try to go in and really paint all of the little um, ringlets. So um, if, if for, for something like that, I would approach it more from knowing where kind of where the light source is and then um, in a way sort of gesturing where the light is catching on those ringlets. Um, and because one thing that I find can be difficult with um, curled hair is almost adding a little too much detail into the um, kind of, or sort of treating it as you would straight hair that um, where it's a little bit easier to see where the highlight is and where the shadow is and everything. Um, for really tightly curled hair, so if you were to look at a um, kind of like hair curl pattern sheet, if you were to be looking at maybe like type four hair. Um, I find that that scatters a lot of light. So um, if you're looking at maybe the, um, yeah, it, it just, it tends to scatter a lot of light and you're not really gonna have a very defined highlight unless you were to really slick it back or something. So I tend to treat it as um, the larger shapes that it is and then, um, also keep in mind that a lot of the time hair tends to catch on itself and sort of form bundles. So um, for something like looser ringlets that are still, um, you know, as far as hair goes, fairly curled, um, I'm going to really focus on the larger shapes that are um, kind of at play there and um, use highlights as, um, not but last resort is the wrong word, but um, you use them very sparingly, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. It, it, it's easy for me to start with detail because I'm a detailed oriented person and I, and I really appreciate your advice starting um, with the greater form and then, and then adding in the highlights um, minimally. So thank you so much. One other thing to add on to that, another thing is um, um, in 
one thing that I would do for kind of picking colors for something like that is I often notice, especially if it's darker hair, um, there might be some sort of more saturated colors in addition that are sort of the mid-tones. And I might, for a lot of the form, use um, more in that family and then save the brightest highlights for um, the part that is the, the most likely to be reflecting the light, if that makes sense. Hopefully that's helpful. I have, I have one more question, if it's all right. Um, and it's about uh, reference materials. So um, you had mentioned and sort of shown some repositories you have in Keep for Yourself. Um, I was wondering where where you sourced um, those those images, and um, if you have any recommendations about places to look for for high quality references for uh, different skin tones. I think there were are like stock image sites dedicated to different um, ethnicities and skin tones, and I was wondering if you could speak to any of those or anything else that you know of. Um, for the most part. Um, as when I'm working, I, um, I really like, um, I really like Pinterest. I just find that in a lot of cases, um, because it's sort of a infinite scroll and you can kind of click something and it is pretty good at showing you just like more of that type of image. Um, I find that I can kind of get a good bank of just things to sort of, um, look at and, and refer to. Um, I also, I find that depending on the project, um, searching on Google can yield some not very um, helpful results, um, especially when it comes to certain ethnicities that tend to be stigmatized. So, what, for example, um, if especially if you're trying to find good images of, um, for example, black children, one thing that's a little bit upsetting is um, on Google, you can end up with a whole bunch of search results for like the adultification of black children and, you know, mug shots and, you know, things like that, um, which is you know not really the best um and uh, so um i know that there are there are some good um kind of stock um images sites um but a lot of the time um i just tend to for whatever reason um not necessarily use them as not not, not because they they aren't good or anything but just my um i guess collecting of reference material tends to either be um, you know, kind of, you know, piecemeal, I'm sitting on my couch and scrolling and being like, oh, that was really cool and adding that to my bank of references or having really specific needs for what I'm looking for that might make it a little bit difficult um, to go through a bank of a particular stock site. So in those cases, I often will maybe take a picture of myself and then infer how that would be different for, um, you know, another body or something. Um, or I might, you know, take a picture of my sister since she has a very different body type from me. And it might be, it's a little bit easier to make that jump with just a different body type. So um, even though I earlier said that it might be is a little difficult sometimes to use the people around you, they're really good for um, kind of a baseline that um, you can kind of be creative and change. Um, I wish that I had a better kind of bank of, spe of specific um, recommendations that I could give for good stock sites, because I know that's something that a lot more people are kind of aware of and trying to kind of work on. Um, but in my typical workflow, it tends to just not be necessarily what I need. Um, one thing that those can be helpful for, I think, is a lot of the time they're very, if you, um, depending on if it's, you know, free or, um, I don't know, you might need a subscription or something. 
Um, a lot of the time the images are very clear, so you might be able to find some really good texture, skin texture especially, um, in them. But um, often I find that I'm able to get a lot of those types of images um, if in a, from a very strange place. So a lot of the time jewelry, um, like marketing images are pretty good for that. Um, I try to keep in mind that they probably have some, a lot of, you know, clever retouching and stuff, but I noticed that in a lot of cases, um, they are very clear and crisp images um, in pretty standard, you know, poses and stuff, um, which is pretty helpful for a medical illustrator, especially. And um, I noticed that, especially in the um, sites and stuff that you can, that are that populate Pinterest, it seems as though in more recent years, there's more of a push to um, not have all of the models kind of look the same. Um, and so you can actually find some really interesting features and, and stuff to sort of refer to. Um, but just in general, since I tend to try to really avoid using a particular reference very heavily, unless I've taken it myself, um, or, you know, absolutely need to. Um, I, uh, my kind of collection of them is fairly transient. I know that was a pretty long <laughs> um, answer. I hope it was helpful. Yes, yes, it was. And appreciate um, the tips about potentially problematic avenues to pursue. Like that's very helpful as well. Um, oh, I also have another, um, I guess, place where you can surprisingly find some good reference material that mm -hmm. and it's also there could be a lot attached to it I guess but um another place where you can and find some pretty good examples of um interesting features in very standardized locations is actually in um cosmetic surgery before and afters um and I tend to look at the before um, mm. but I also try to be really careful about, um, being really respectful with those because it's, you know, a real person, a patient, and also, um, even though there's a lot attached to it, there is a reason why this person chose to undergo a procedure. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. So, um, that's a case where I try to be really careful about, um, I guess keeping that in mind um because there's always a lot attached to that type of thing totally that makes sense thanks um i think alex in toronto has a question i do indeed um I have a lot of questions but i will ask one and i also do just want to say again thank you so much hillary uh incredible talk it's always a pleasure having you and this was very insightful i think in terms of how to approach um my own like workflow and just like for fun um I am curious I guess like thinking back to bringing it to medical illustration if you had to combine this with uh skin tones and like dermatological issues or something that would present differently on uh these varied skin types how would you suggest going about finding that when oftentimes those references are quite limited uh, by just what's available in medical textbooks and on google as well um, in my experience, one thing that I found um, extremely helpful is um, if you happen to be, in my case, if I've been working with, um, you know, a medical professional um, who is kind of the primary, you know, expert on, um, you know, the conditions and everything like that, um, in a lot of cases, they might have some good examples um, that might be a little bit too gory or, or something, um, but, but um, they often have um, some, you know, either anonymized or um, just kind of some, some um, materials that they could send. So that's something that I um, will often kind of um, keep as, uh, you know, as I'm working. Um, for an example of that. And then also asking them um, is really helpful, which everybody knows. Um, another thing that I find helpful is um, kind of in the 
information gathering stage, the research stage, really getting deep into um, like primary literature um, because um, in those cases, they can sometimes have some really interesting imagery that either um, shows some really important information or gives me information where I can infer what it would look like. Um, so for a, an example of this, um, in some of my illustrations that I've done before, um, I had to do a cross section of a hair follicle that was um, on you know, curled hair. So a follicle that isn't straight, but instead is kind of C-shaped. And um, it was sort of really difficult to find a lot of examples of this. That was, wasn't something that I saw very often. But one thing that I found really helpful was um, kind of finding primary literature on it where there might be, um, for, especially with um, things surrounding hair loss. So I saw some interesting images of, um, you know, like a fo like follicles that had been kind of removed, I think for, um, you know, a hair loss treatment or something. So one thing that, um, Unfortunately, there are, in a lot of cases aren't necessarily that many great um, materials out there, but a lot of the time going to the source, um, you know, especially with primary literature, is kind of the way that I might sort of figure out how it might look and then getting a, um, a stamp of approval from a medical professional is usually pretty helpful. But um, unfortunately, with certain types of things, it's a little bit tough. Um, it also is um, helpful for me to really look at just people in real life. So um, one thing that I often do, I, I just am somebody, I love scars and stuff. I'm, I'm weird, um, <laughs> I guess, but aren't we all? Um, I just find scars and things really interesting. And so it's something that I might kind of notice and um, sort of like without, you know, being rude, noticing the um, colors and stuff that are present, or if some, you just happen to know somebody, or, or you could even look at yourself or something, um, that can be really helpful. So like one of the reasons why I just, I happen to know pretty well how um, eczema looks is because my sister has, you know, extremely severe um, eczema that has required like constant care for a, probably a decade at this point. Um, and so, just real life can be really helpful for those types of things as well.